Welcome to this YouTube channel which features the Sunday School Lessons from Village Bible Church in Bella Vista, Arkansas. To help internet viewers more readily find our channel, please click on the subscribe button below and then click on the like button. This helps YouTube's algorithms to feature our channel to more viewers. Thank you for watching. The Book of 2 Peter, the third chapter addresses several key themes primarily focusing on the concept of the end times and the return of Jesus Christ. Here's an overview of 2 Peter chapter 3. 1. The Delay of the Second Coming chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. Peter begins by reminding his readers about the predictions of the prophets and apostles regarding the second coming of Jesus Christ. He acknowledges that some may question the apparent delay in this event emphasizing the importance of patience and understanding in God's timing. 2. The Certainty of God's Promise Chapter 3 verses 5-7 through 7. Peter uses the example of the flood during the time of Noah as a reminder that God's judgment is certain. He asserts that God's word is trustworthy, and just as God judged the world with water in the past, there will be a future judgment by fire. 3. The Day of the Lord Chapter 3 verses 8 through 10. Peter addresses the perceived delay in the return of Christ by explaining that God's perspective on time is different from ours. He emphasizes that the delay is a result of God's patience, giving people time to repent. The day of the Lord will come unexpectedly, and the heavens and earth will be judged by fire. 4. The Call to Holy Living Chapter 3 verses 11 through 18. In light of the imminent return of Jesus and the coming judgment, Peter encourages believers to live holy and godly lives. He emphasizes the importance of moral conduct and spiritual growth. Peter also warns against being led astray by false teachings and encourages his readers to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. 5. Conclusion 318 The chapter concludes with a call to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Peter encourages believers to be on guard against false teachings and to remain steadfast in their faith. In summary, 2 Peter, chapter 3 serves as a reminder of the certainty of God's promises, the impending judgment, and the importance of living a holy and godly life in anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ. The chapter emphasizes patience, perseverance, and spiritual growth in the face of challenges and false teachings. Ron Allen has a wonderful teaching on the book of Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3. Please join Ron now with his teaching on this great section of Peter's letters. So I think we'll just begin with, with prayer. Almighty God, we come to you this morning realizing how magnificent you are, how great you are in wisdom and knowledge. Um, here to help us to extend your power, your spirit into our lives today through the word. Thankful, Lord, that you have said several times in your word that you'll never leave us. You would never forsake us and that uh, your presence with us is, is a complete promise that we can believe today. And we, we just love and honor you, honor your name. And the best as uh, we know how, the best as we can, we, we just give glory to you however that works. And uh, I pray for you that you would help us this morning to open our hearts and our minds to understand, uh, especially this portion of Scripture. And, um, and, and we love you. We love you this morning. And it's your word that balances out our life and centers us and helps us make the many daily decisions that we make because it's a powerful word. 
So it's in your glorious name I pray these things. Amen. Amen. The text is printed on a piece of paper that you have in front of you, most of you. If you don't have one, there's more up here. Um, the reason I do that is so we can just literally be on the same page. Uh, it's a New Living Translation. But it's helped to open your Bible next to that and, and go along and watch while we're doing this. Um, the text is 2 Peter chapter 3. It, uh, the last chapter of Second Peter, and we will be looking at the second chapter as well, uh, just to, to know why he um, gave the third chapter, and so we'll be doing that in a few minutes. So let's look at the first verse of, of it. It says, this is my second letter to you, dear friends. Let's stop right there. This is my second letter to you, dear friends. Who is he writing to? George. Who's he writing to? Um, someone look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and just read it for me. 1 Peter chapter 1. Read it real loud for me. To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Is that 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 1? To God's elect, strangers right. in the world, Thank you. Blood. Yeah, and so he mentions these five areas here, uh, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And uh, we see those on this map. Can you guys in the back see this map? You probably can't. But uh, this, this whole area here, right up here is the Black Sea. And then uh, this is the first one he mentions, Bith Bithynia. He mentioned Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and um, down here. And so these are the places where uh, many of the, of the Jewish Christians um, ran. Yeah, they, they were chased out of uh, Jerusalem in that area, and they lived up there in that area. And Bithynia, there at the top, is where... Uh, the Apostle Paul wanted to go on his second missionary journey. He came up through Galatia, and he wanted to go up there for uh, some reason, you know. Uh, and this Pontus here was the god of Bithynia. And uh, he was the god of the water, the god of... And here's a picture of him here, uh, in case you're interested. I don't know who did this, but it was on, online. But here he is. This was the Pontus, and he was the god that they worshipped up there. In Bithynia, there's fish in there. You know, it's like the god of the sea. Uh, I don't know who draws those pictures, but... Um, but anyway, um, remember that the night before he was going to go up there, he had a vision of, from God. And the vision was, was from someone up in here who uh, said, come over and help us. Uh, it, it, that really haunts me. It's, it's one of those, it's in the 16th chapter of Acts. And it says, a man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And that just, that just grabs me because I wonder if if we could all have that same uh, desire or when we look at people, you know, around us, the people out there that they're, uh, they're lost, you know, they're, they're struggling, they're, there's heartaches, just like Pastor mentioned this morning in his sermon, uh, and uh, inability to answer hard questions and how they face, you know, this year and this time of year and all that's going on. Gripped by sin. People we walk past every day in the malls and in the streets in our neighborhoods. Gripped by sin. The evil one has its hold 
on those who do not know Christ. And, uh, and he was gripped, Paul was gripped by this vision of this person said, come over and help us. So he continued on and went straight up into Macedonia to Philippi. You remember the story up there. And uh, um, so Galatia was the next one. Galatia is this area right here. And he visited Galatia many times, this area here. And uh, went, went, came up through there on his first missionary journey and then came back through there again. And uh, Galatia was another area where the Christians fled when they ran from Jerusalem. And probably, I'm guessing, I don't know, but Timothy's um, grandmother and mother and them lived up there in uh, Lystra. And they, they may have ran, you know, they may have been those who fled too and were living up in that area. I don't know that for a fact, but it just seems like it could be. And um, so... Uh, the uh, idea of all of these people being up here, there was, their gods were these mythological gods, you know, the Greek gods, uh, those uh, Zeus and Hermes, you remember the apostle was up there in that area in Galatia at Lystra, and he healed a crippled person. And they all said, well, he must be a god, you know, it must be Zeus and Hermes, him and Silas. And so they, they uh, were going to worship them and, and all of this. And, and then Paul, of course, got across to him that this is not who they are. And then they wanted to kill him, you know. And, of course, he was stoned to death there and uh, was brought back to life. And so that was... That was uh, an area that he knew a lot about. It's interesting about these gods because if you if you look through the Bible, you see them mentioned. Like when the Apostle Paul was on his journey, um, the, in chapter twenty of Acts, he was on his last you know shipwreck journey, and it says that in chapter in Acts twenty eight it says he boarded an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of twin gods. And the names of gods are Castor and Pulux, P-O-L-L-U-X. Well, Pulux was the son of Zeus. It's interesting how all this, that these people really believed all this. These pagan people in all those areas up there. Uh, probably 99% or more of the people believed in these, these gods and all this kind of thing. And... Uh, followed them and did sacrifices to them and had, there was a temple to Zeus outside of Lystra and uh, so when you look at that today this is Turkey uh, this is all those places where he was this is present day Turkey now and uh, I'll talk about that in a minute but it's interesting because Asia was one of the areas that's men mentioned where he wrote the letter to. And this is the seven churches of uh, Revelation. And um, John was out here on an island about a little less than 40 miles away from the mainland. And uh, if you remember in Revelation, it starts with Ephesus. And they made it easy for us, so they just put them in a little circle <laughs> for us. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Lartyra, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And Laodicea is really interesting because that's, there are those, and there might be some in this room who believe that uh, each of those is an age of the church or age for Christianity throughout the time. Uh, I don't, there was a time when I did that, but I don't uh, follow that too closely. But if you do, uh, you would say that Laodicea was the time we were living in now when uh, church is lukewarm and all this and that. But it's interesting about Laodicea because it was right next to Colossae. Uh, Colossae where Paul never visited, it's not up on this map, and Hierapolis. And all these three cities were within 12 miles of each other. And it's really interesting because Colossae was known for its cold springs. Hierapolis was known for its hot springs. 
What was Leo do you see it known for? Lukewarm Springs. <laughs> it's interesting. And uh, it was known for its expensive black wool that was made and sold there. It was known for it for Phrygian powder, which they made eye ointment with. Well, sir, here's what the Spirit says to the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3. I know all the things you do, yet you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And then in the 18th verse, it says, also buy white garments. <laughs> it's interesting that their black wool is their main thing. Also buy white garments for me, so you not be ashamed of your nakedness and ointment for your eyes. So you'll be able to see. It's interesting how the Spirit used uh, various characteristics of the area that he's uh, speaking to. So here, so this is, I believe, is what Peter's heart is when he, uh, when he looks at this up here, at what's going on up there. And he prays for these people. He knows so many of these Christians that have left Jerusalem. And he knows roughly where they are up there. And he prays for them and worries about their lives and worries about them being tainted by the community around them, where they live, that their minds might be changed, uh, or they might fall asleep, so to speak. I'll enlarge on that in a minute. With, with their Christian life, and get um, just overwhelmed by the 99% of other secular and religious people that live all around him. And um, so he says in the first verse, he says, I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking. You see that? I've tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. That's what he wants to do. Stimulate them. That phrase in the Greek is interesting. Uh, that's, that's one word in the Greek is uh, stimulate your wholesome thinking. And here's what it means. It means to wake fully, to arouse, to arise, awake, raise, stir up. That's what it means. That the Christianity that they had learned had become so very excited about when they became saved, the, the new believers. You've all seen that. And you were excited when you first got saved. You remember that. Uh, my brother and I, we, twin brother and I got saved the same night at a... Um, a revival meeting or my mom made us go up every night for two weeks within our town but anyway we, we went forward to, and got saved we weren't sitting together so I didn't know he went he didn't know I went and this older man put their arm around us and prayed for us and we became saved and we went home they told us to read the gospel of John my brother and I was we were 13 years old we, we slept in the same bed and so we we just read the Gospel of John until we fell asleep. We read the whole thing. We're so excited because that's what they told us to do. And you get excited. And, and uh, then sometimes you go out there and you go and you may, may move away from where you were or from your family or from supportive friends. And then you start, um, uh, you, you fade away from that, that wonderful joy that you felt and um, and here see here's what Peter here was his issue he he wrote about it in a second chapter and I'm going to have Karen read it for me right now would you the second chapter but there were also false prophets in Israel just as there will be false teachers among you they will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. Yeah, the master who bought them. It's interesting. It's, it's not actually part of my lesson, but uh, it's interesting that there's a big divide in Christian in uh, evangelical Christianity today as to uh, who did Christ die for? Did he die for just the elect, or did he die for all people? And um, of course, I'm of I'm of the school that he died for all. But uh, it's very strong, especially in the Evangelical Free Church uh, 
and, and, and those who teach, teach uh, the other way. But anyway, he says here, um, he said there that uh, the people he, whom he bought, right? Yeah. And so that's, that's not just, that was everybody, you know, and some were just, uh, you know, rebels. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell, in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So, you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, yeah. even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the final day of judgment. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. But the angels who are far greater in power and strength do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against those supernatural beings. These false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they do not understand, and, like animals, they will be destroyed. Their destruction is their reward for the harm they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. They are a disgrace and a stain among you. They delight in deception, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. They commit adultery with their eyes, and their desire for sin is never satisfied. They lure unstable people into sin, and they are well trained in greed. They live under God's curse. They have wandered off the right road and followed the footsteps of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. But Balaam was stopped from his mad course when his donkey rebuked him with a human voice. These people are as useless as dried up springs or as mist blown away by the wind. They are doomed to blackest darkness. They brag about themselves with empty foolish boasting. With an appeal to twisted sexual desires, they lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. It would be better if they had never known the way of righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. They prove the truth of this proverb. A dog returns to its vomit, and another says, a washed pig returns to the mud. So, so um, these, these kind of people always have existed. They existed then and they exist now, and these people do come in among religious people and religious organizations and churches. And um, so just imagine yourself right now. Imagine yourself 
um, in a place, wherever it's this country or another country or anywhere, where 99.8% of the people uh, are pagan and pagan religions of all kinds, and you are among the 0.02% or whatever it is that are trying to live a godly life. Think about that. By the way, the whole country of Turkey uh, is 99.8% Muslim. <clears throat> Turkey is. And, uh, and we have our wonderful missionaries there. I mean, some of you met the Phipps, uh, Phipps, I mean, when they were here at our missionary conference. You remember them? Uh, I really love their presentation, uh, Brian and Dana Phipps and their beautiful family. But here they live in the midst of a country that's completely Muslim, but they do have a law that allows Christians to be there. But see, that doesn't help when you have people who, you know, individuals who hate Christianity. and they're, So they're in a dangerous area, so we need to pray for them. Um, but what about here and now, where we are right now, where we live right now, our country? Do you see uh, any kind of um, sinful behavior that things that are going on that might uh, distract Christians? Let me speak up if there's something you want to say about that. Yes, ma'am. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you go to the store, whether you turn on the TV, yeah. whether you open your internet, yeah. the corruption, the perversion, yeah. it's all right there and, and being accepted as, uh, you know, just way things off. Right. And look at the churches, like how many churches are accepting <coughs> the homosexual lifestyle yeah. and, and allowing them to teach. And yeah. Teach. Right. It's a fallen world. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, Rose. A big part of it started with secular humanism in yeah. the school, mm -hmm. changing the children's perspective from their parents teaching them Christianity yeah. and making them open their minds to right. their possibilities. And this went through, you know, probably later 60s until today where most of the schools are this woke uh, yeah. perspective that is being right. taught. Yeah. Yeah, it really does start in the schools, doesn't it? Yes, ma'am. It's in our families. Yeah. 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 Yes. In in fact, I I believe from what I see, if the word God is used in any narrative, you're a marked person. And then if you put the J bomb there, the <laughs> Jesus bomb, then you're really ostracized. Just just like this book says, they will scoff, mock, and uh, call you a fool. You know. So, uh, yes, that degradation has already yeah. been rejected. That absolute truth doesn't fly anymore. It's the relativism, yeah. like you said. And I look at, yes. And I was reading the word, and it was talking about how the Israelites, remember they couldn't cross over because they forgot what God did for them. Yeah.
Oh boy. Yes, sir. And I brought it home to my dad. Yeah. And I said, Well, dad, this is the king of the ace. I understand. Yeah. What am I saying to them? Yeah. Well, my dad came there and he talked to them. And got a straight doubt. But the point is, go, Dad. Our parents have to stand up and yeah. be stronger than they are. Yes. Yeah. And this is America. Yeah. It's not perfect, but it's better than all the other countries. Yeah. There's other countries. Yeah. And I think that so many, so many families are broken up, you know, they're divided. You know, it's no secret that I drive a school bus. I see the kids, you know, and I know, I know some of the stories already, you know. And this, this little girl has to, she can only come every other week because she's with her dad this week and mom this week. And, and I think it's hard for them to get taught uh, from a, you know, a family structure the truth. And I think that's big in our country too right now. Yes, sir. I, I think that the, what we have to understand is there's two major differences between Turkey and here. And it's called know your enemy. Yeah. To, in, a Christian in Turkey knows who the enemy is. Here, yeah. we don't know, well, we should, yeah. but we don't know the enemy. Discernment, yeah. Uh, and I think that's really important. Uh, when we yeah. look at these places and you see what God is doing there, yeah. right, with a small number of Christian, Christians yes. compared to here, yeah. it's, that's, the, that's the difference. Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it's yeah. also in corporate America. Yeah. Um, people, well, it looks like, I don't to say the name, but a major corporation that has allows a prayer room for the Muslims but certainly no prayer room for Christians. Yeah. Or dare you bring yeah. up Jesus yeah. and then, you know, your a promotion is withheld and I mean I could talk all day about Yeah. That. Well thank you. That's important. So so um, in the in the second verse uh, Peter says, I want you to remember what the holy prophets said long ago. And what would that be? That would be the Old Testament, right? And what our Lord and Savior commanded through the apostles, which would be the New Testament. Understand? So he's, he's talking here is that we need to know the Bible, right? We need to study the Bible. We need to know the Bible. We need to have it going through our brain every day. Um, in the book of Jude, and by the way, Jude and Second Peter 2 are very similar. When you read them, they're, they're almost the same. But here's what Jude said in the 17th verse. But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times there will be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. And uh, so... We need to prepare ourselves for the battle that we face every day, and we do face the battle every day. And I think it's wonderful that our church provides this reading schedule, a biblical Bible reading schedule, one which I've been on for years. That was great when Al Frank brought that in, but uh, just to, to read it. But you don't have to read that much. If it's a problem for you, just read some and take it with you and write a verse down on a card and put it on the dash of your car or something, you know. And, and It's a battle that we're facing, and uh, we need to prepare ourselves for the coming judgment day and be prepared. Um, but you, my dear friends, must remember, that's what he says, what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. And the first one was that scoffers will come. Scoffers will come. Verse 3. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. Scoffers are mockers. It's a, in the Greek, it comes out about the same word. In the first chapter of the book we're in right now, of Second Peter, he says in the 19th verse, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. That's the Old Testament, right? You must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place. And it is, you know. Uh, 
you know, we can go out even when the sun's shining, but when we go out, it, it is darkness, you know, out there. And, and, but when we pay attention you know, to the Word of God, that means we, we have it in front of us, we memorize, you know, and know it until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. And um, <coughs> Testament, you know, just just one of the great ones is one of the Psalms. I just want to read it. It's where the psalmist says, it's the same situation like we're talking about here. It says, but I will call on God and the Lord will rescue me. Morning, noon, and night, I cry out in my distress. And the Lord hears my voice. He ransoms me and keeps me safe from the battle waged against me. Though many still oppose me, God, who has ruled forever, will hear me and humble them. For my enemies refuse to change their ways. They do not fear God. But, but we have these promises that we can claim. That was uh, Psalm chapter 55, verses 16 to 19. So he says again, I want you to remember what the Holy Prophets said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through the apostles. Uh, scoffers, most importantly, verse 3, I want to remind you that the last day scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, do any of you look at the interlinear when you're studying the Bible? Uh, yeah. Inter, the interlinear is, right. you can get it right on your, uh, in online. But what it is, it's, uh, uh, it's the text the in the order that the words came in the original Greek. And then it has, a inter, you know, the, the, the um, English and then the, parts of speech and everything, but I just want to see, I just, I just uh, took this out, I want you to see what it says about scoffers, because it, the text doesn't say that, but it says, this is an, in the order that it is in the Greek, this first knowing that will come in the last of the days with, and here it is, scoffing scoffers, that's what it says in the original, it doesn't just say scoffers, it says scoffing scoffers, and I think that, it works. I think that means that it's it's uh, it's going on, you know. It's people are you know being scoffed at, and um, if if we're not trained in the scriptures, and we don't have, you know, we have a wonderful church here. I tell you, Bible studies from for women, for men, discipleship, the things that we really need to take advantage of. If we're not trained in the scriptures. If we're, if we're not involved in the Bible on a daily basis, not just Sunday, sun, just Sunday's not enough. And what a wonderful preacher we have here. This guy's such a great communicator. I just love it. And, but, if, but if we don't have basic knowledge, we can't defend our positions, what we really believe in. I recall back way back when I was in my late teens, I worked for Iowa, Illinois Gas and Electric Company. And we did construction. I went out and dug ditches and did pipe and all that kind of stuff. And there was a fellow there about my age, and he invited me to go sailing with him on a sea scow, which was really fun. We went out on the sea scow. It's a two-man sailboat, and they race, you know, and we did, went on the Mississippi River. We lived right on the Mississippi River. And uh, I had so much fun uh, with him, and I loved it. And, um, you know, you learn how to look at the water, and you could tell where the puffs were by shadows and all stuff like that. Well, one day all of us were together, and the crew, you know, they're kind of rough guys. Especially when they're together, they like to be macho and swear and do all their stuff, you know, they do. And I, I don't know what the conversation was. I said, but you know what, I'm, just, I'm looking forward to... Uh, go in the Moody Bible Institute, you know. And oh, this friend of mine, who was my friend, he just got vile. He says, that dilapidated old school and that disgusting Bible, you know, and he just went off and I was shocked. I, I couldn't defend myself. I didn't know. I was just so shocked I didn't know what to say. And I, I didn't, you know. I mean, I liked the guy, you know, I, and so forth. 
And um, uh, I wish I wish I would ask him, which I have since others that who who have knocked the Bible. Uh, well, well, did you read it? You know, most cases they haven't they haven't read it. You know, they might have heard about it and read a couple chapters or something, but they haven't really read it or studied it or anything like that. And I was a bit shaken by that. Even though I, you know, I was a Christian, I grew up, you know, my mom was a wonderful Christian. The church I went to didn't do discipleship. You know, they didn't, I, I, don't, they, I don't think they said it was wrong or anything. They just didn't do it, you know, and you just, so the one-on-one, -on -one, you didn't really get. I think we need it. I, I do. I think we need to, to have a mature believer sit down with, with us and discuss, you know, and just talk about life and the Word and all this and that. I think we need to do that. Uh, see, here's what Peter said, too, in the first, first book, letter. I love this. Um, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. You see, really it's true. It's true. When a Christian is in the Word, when I say in the Word, you're reading it and you're thinking about it. You know, when you're in the Word, it, it comes out in a reflection of your countenance. Because God's, God is love, you know, and, and His righteousness shines through you. And people see that. Uh, and they'll say, they might, may say, maybe you guys here have a testimony of that. Um, what is it about you anyway? You, you always seem like, you're, you always seem happy, you know, and you always seem like they, they look at you, people look at you, and they'll say, why? Well, then you give a defense. Then you say, this is why. It's because of what Jesus has done in my heart. That's a wonderful way to give a testimony. And then he goes on in that verse to say, uh, um, uh, do it with gentleness and respect. Don't argue. Don't argue and fight with non-believers about this stuff. Don't, don't bring yourself down to their level. You know, be kind. Uh, be loving. Tell the truth. And, uh, but don't fight with scoffers. You don't want to do that. They don't gain anything. Not a thing. And verse 4 says, They will say, What happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything's remained the same since the world was first created. Oh, how wrong they are. How wrong they are. They think, oh, this is a perfect argument. You know, that's for, that just nothing's changed. Verse 5. Look at verse 5. And if you have your Bibles, you probably have different translations here. Uh, the New Living Translation says, they deliberately. You see that? I think some say willingly. Does any of yours have different words there? But they deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. You know, he spoke, right? And it was created. That most wonderful thing. However, as I was, I was talking to Joe Schmidt yesterday about this and that people especially young people, but I'm sure older people, but especially young people are really ignorant about life. Just about life in general, about things, you know, about, it's just like, like they're in this bubble, you know, of no knowledge. You, you've seen those on the street interviews, you know, and they ask these questions that are so simple and they don't know. But, um, but I think people just believe, well, I'm just here. I just ha it just happened. You know, it, there's no explanation about creation. We are taught. I was taught in high school that we evolved. They had the pictures of all the creatures, you know, <laughs> the Piltdown Man and the Java Man and, yeah. and uh, all those. And I lived long enough to see all of them refuted. 
One, one was, I can't remember which one it was, but it was the jawbone of a, of a pig. Was what they had created a, a, this man out of. Just a one bone, you know. And, oh man, I had, I love this gal. I don't, can't remember her name anymore because that was 1958 or back in there. And she sat right here and my desk was here. She was a Christian. I was a Christian, but I was a very, very bashful and not real knowledgeable Christian. And, he, and the teacher, and they were teaching evolution. And this gal stands up. She has her Bible in class. It's through her well-worn Bible right there on her desk. And she stands up. And she starts reading from Genesis about the creation, you know. And I was just blown away. I mean, I thought, boy, I wish I had what she had. I wish I could have done that too. But the teacher smirked. He was a smirky guy anyway. I can see his face right now. He smirked. He didn't believe it, you know. And she, and when she was reading, her Bible slipped out of her hand. It was, it was, the binding was bad on it. It fell on the floor. And I was sitting next to her, so I reached out and helped pick it up. But I thought, you know, right, even right there where here's this person giving a defense. Uh, and Satan is busy trying to destroy and steal and take away, you know. And then everybody laughed. You know, I still remember that. But, uh, you know, so um, they're wrong. See, look at verse 5. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. That's, you know, it's uh, right in Genesis 1, you know, that the earth was, was all covered with water. It was all water. It says, um, the second verse says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It was all water. There was no land there. And then you drop down to verse 9 in chapter 1 of Genesis, and it says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and they separated the waters that were under the expanse from waters that were above the expanse and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven and there was evening and morning the second day. And so um, this, this is a, a truth. It's a basic biblical truth that, by the way, our forefathers who went to school back in the centuries back, they taught, they taught Bible truth in their classrooms and they taught creation and all this kind of thing. And um, so scoffers aren't, aren't ignorant of the Bible, you know, but uh, look what it says, they deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. So uh, um, then um, they deny the fact that God did act in a mighty way when he created the world. That, that must be something you have seen. The second mistake the scoffers make is that God destroyed the earth and all of the people, Noah's flood, they don't think about that. That was way out of the ordinary, what he did there. He used water, verse 6, he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And he had plenty of water to do that. There was water under the earth. There's water on the earth. There's water above the earth. He had plenty of water. That, that's not even a, a thing to worry about. And the entire planet changed, you know, at that point. There, where there was no mountains, there became mountains. You know, everything changed. It was a dramatic thing that God did in many countries around the world. If you look back in their history and the writings on rocks and things, they talk about a flood of, that covered the earth and, and animals being protected on a boat. That's a, that was a, a real teaching. So if Almighty God could change the earth with a flood, 
In other words, he judged the earth. That's what he did. That was judgment. Um, then he judged the sinful world. And um, you can say that nothing has happened since the beginning, which is, isn't true. And look at verse 7. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They're being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. And of course, that, that doesn't say annihilated. It, it's, uh, it says destroyed. And the Bible teaches that for those who refuse to repent and turn to Christ for salvation, that both body and soul will be destroyed in hell, which is, was it, which is an eternal state and uh, not the end of life. Um, just a few miles below the surface of the earth is, is a ball of fire. The earth sits on top of a ball of fire of tremendous heat. And um, we don't have to explain how God will destroy the earth. He, he can do it without our explanation or our science. But I don't think it will be that hard for him to do. And um, so I, I personally believe that this fiery destruction will occur following the millennium after the thousand year reign and the great white throne judgment. And I think that's when the, all things will be destroyed. And even the heavens, it says, which could be, the, be you know, planets or stars or things like that. But it, do, it does use the word heavens in there. And um, so uh, verse 8 says, But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. In fact, with God there is no time. He doesn't have time in his economy up there. God sees everything as, as if it's happening right now. He sees Adam and Eve. He sees the future. He sees us. He sees everything as it's happening. There's no time with him. It's so different than our perspective. He sees all from the beginning to the end. And, and he's not dilly-dallying around, you know, like they might think. Verse 9 says, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. He's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. And from our perspective, he's being patient so that many more will be saved. And that's a wonderful thing. Verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. And by the way, that word in the Greek is interesting. I looked that up in Strong. Uh, Roy Zadon, if you say it like that. There's a Z in there. And it means a whir, a noise, a whir, whizzingly. That is with a crash, with a great noise. That's what it'll, what it'll be like. I'm, I'm sure it'll be quite noisy when everything is destroyed. Um, and uh, verse 11 says, Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. So looking at that verse I just read, verse 11, why, in the light of that verse, why are we to live holy and godly lives? Why? Think about it. Look at that verse. I mean, we know the commands and other scriptures that we are to be holy because God is holy. But as you look at that, um, hurrying along the day of God, that's an interesting statement. Uh, will our godly lives cause folks to turn to God? We touched on that a little bit. Do you think that's true? Do you think that's true of you? Do you? That your life, the way you live your life, 
may cause more people to come to Christ. You think so? Yes. Do you think it, and don't you think if he's waiting for more people to be saved that our holy and godly lives may hurry along the day of God? Is that possible? Just think about it, you know. Um, are we so excited? Look, when you read that, um, a new heaven and a new earth, you read there, something really wonderful for us. Um, are we so excited about this future that God has in store for us? A world filled with righteousness is what it says. There'll be no evil Amen. at all. You know, uh, wouldn't that cause us, shouldn't that cause us, our countenance to go up and others to see that, as Peter said, and ask you, what about, what is it about you, you know? You know, <laughs> There, there's, a, there's a text in Romans. Romans is a great book. I think it was the last book I taught at my church when I was... But uh, in chapter 10, he, uh, he says this. Listen to this. But I asked, did the people of Israel really understand? Yes, they did. For even in the time of Moses, and this is written in Deuteronomy, he's referring to, God said, I will rouse your jealousy through people who are not even a nation. That means uh, Gentiles, the Jewish people. I will provoke your anger through foolish Gentiles. This, this is what it's saying. Uh, can the very fact that you and I will someday inhabit a new heavens and a new earth, a world filled with God's righteousness, get us so excited. Amen. Fill us with such awe. That it oozes out of our pores. It just oozes out. The excitement and the desire and the hope. So much that folks out there cannot even help to see that in us. And say, what is that that they have and I want it? You know something, I pray for my family every morning when I'm driving to work. And I pray for my, my brother's kids. And there's, there's some, you know, I would like to see get saved and all this and that. And um, in one family, there's, there's uh, two of them are saved and two not. And the ones that are saved, I pray, God, help them live such a life that the others will just be jealous of what they have. So much that they'll want what they have. That's really what it says, you know, that we live such a life that others say, I want that. I'm jealous of what you have. That's a good jealousy, by the way. That's a good kind of jealousy. You must worship Christ as Lord in your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people are against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a life, a good life you live because you belong to Christ. 1 Peter 3, 15, 16. What time is it? Verse 13. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised. A world filled with righteousness. And this is the key to preparing for the coming judgment of God. What are the results of living a holy and godly life with the excitement of an outlook of a new heavens and new earth in which dwells God's righteousness? Verse 14. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, Make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. Right? 
that's that's the result of living of of believing in that wonderful future that we have. We're waiting for these things to happen. It says, make every effort. In my Bible, when I read that, I would underline that. Make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. So, yes, ma'am. I love that verse because um, that's where it went to my heart. But I have a lot of my friends, and even people that I just talk to about, you know, faith and kind of stuff. Yeah. They're all being very raptured. You know, they all want to get to heaven. But you know what? We need to get started. Yeah. Really. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think the Apostle Paul taught some of that too later on, you know. Don't don't wait around and sit around. Yeah. Yeah. So um verse eighteen says, Rather you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus and Savior Jesus Christ. All glory to him both now and forevermore. Amen. So I think that's our time is up, right? And um, is there any any comment that anyone wants to make before I? Yes. If you know, I, I have a, a sorrow in my heart because I read a testimony by a young woman. Hang on a minute. Hang on. Let's get the microphone. Yeah. Right here. Right here. Oh. Here. 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 Uh, again, I, I read a testimony, a book by a young woman who had been brought up in a Christian home, but through a relative who was very, um, very instrumental in what was called Christian yoga. Uh, she was uh, inveigled into Christian yoga, quote unquote and uh, spent years um, as, as a, an instructor in it. And she described how slowly but surely her attention was rooted in, uh, in, in things totally contrary to God's Word. Yeah. So I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. Uh, I, I wish I could recall the young woman's yeah. name. She, she has quite a reputation. Yeah. I, I heard her testimony yeah. uh, on oh, yeah. radio, and so I just want to yeah. send a word of caution right. out. Well, we have to be careful. Yeah. We have to be careful. So, well, thank you all. Thank you for your participation, you. and uh, yeah. let's have a prayer. Yeah. Lord, I just thank you now for this day you've given us. Uh, a day to, to enjoy your presence in our lives. And uh, even, even in each one of our lives, I pray that even today, there might be that one opportunity, that one person that we come in contact with that, uh, that, that our lives might reflect uh, the wonders of Jesus Christ to them and open a conversation. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.